Hi everyone, welcome to this YouTube live uh, Meet the Speaker event with Yen Perkis. So um, as some of you may know, Yen is a speaker at this upcoming Autism from the Inside Online Summit that starts literally Monday. So we are very, very, very close to that. Um, and today we get a bit of an informal chat with Yen and get to know them a little bit more. Thank you. So welcome, Yen. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Um, now, our topic for the summit is on is on mental health, um, and um, you've had a lot of um, mental health advocacy over the years, years and things like that. Um, do you want to share a little bit of like some of some of your story, just really briefly for for those who may not know you? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm an autistic advocate and author. I have got, now got eleven published books, including one about autism and mental health. Um, I have a pretty extensive history of accessing mental health services over the years. Uh, I have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and also anxiety and depression and um, all sorts of mental health things as well as being autistic and my life has been very challenging I think a lot of the time due to my mental illness and also the lack of understanding that a lot of clinicians have in the mental health space when you come to be an autistic person accessing mental health services it can be quite challenging and I've certainly found it challenging but I do very well I manage a huge workload um, I do a lot of presentations I also work full-time for the Australian Public Service and I've been doing that since 2007 and yeah I'm a very busy person I was just saying to Paul beforehand that I should probably learn that lovely little word no but the problem is I enjoy it too much and I do I love my advocacy work my passion my autistic passion my special interest if you like for the last 10 years has been autism advocacy so I've done a fair amount of it and it's just lovely and it's an absolute privilege to get to be part of this event um, and, and, and yeah, to share my story and to get to speak to you tonight. Yeah, so you do an incredible amount of stuff. I'm always in awe of your energy for advocacy and writing and all of the other things that, that you're doing. How, how do you maintain that, that energy? Well, it is tricky. Um, one of the things, there's a few things I have going for me that make it possible. And one of them is I'm very decisive. When I write something, I'll draft it. And then when I go to edit, I know exactly what it needs to look like. And so I make it look like that. Mm. Most people don't write like that. Most people take a lot more time drafting and redrafting and editing. I don't have to. I know what it needs to look like. So that's one thing that makes my absurd workload possible. The other is that I'm very confident and I know that I can do it. I don't, I'm not held back by self-doubt. Um, mm. I know I can write, I know I can give a talk. And the other thing is motivation. I love this stuff. You know, this is my bread and butter. This is what I like to do. Um, so it's not really hard to do things that you love, isn't it? What they say, you know, um, love your job and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's exactly how I feel about both my, my day job in the public service and also my, um, what I call my outside of work work, which is my advocacy and writing. And have you always had that self-confidence? Oh, absolutely not. Um, I have a very difficult past. I spent three and a half years in prison when I was in my 20s. I have major mental health issues. I've spent, I actually calculated last year that I'd spent 10 years of my life in institutions of one kind or another. So prison, hospital, wow. yeah. mental health services. So I was somebody who was expected to die really young. If I wasn't going to die, I was not expected to do anything particularly edifying or meaningful with my life. And yet I changed that. So when I was 25, I decided to change my life. I decided I wanted to be ordinary. And that sounds horrible, but it was actually a really good thing. Because ordinary for me meant having a professional job, an education, a mortgage and a suit. Probably not in that order. And... Um, Yes, and so that's what I set out to do. Um, I had no confidence and I couldn't work. I couldn't work at all. I got a job washing dishes in a restaurant when I was 26 and I was so anxious about it. I was such a perfectionist that the stress turned into psychosis and I had to go to hospital and quit the job 
And I remember at the time thinking, well, I can't work now, but I will be able to work in the future. So I always had that positivity, okay. that motivation, and that enabled me to go on the trajectory that I've been on. But it hasn't always been a very straight and you know, um, clear trajectory. There have been ups and downs. There have been um, bumps in the road, stumbling blocks, things like that. Um, but I've built my confidence over a period of about 20, 25 years. Um, and I think that's true for most people. I think when you're young, it's hard to be confident, especially if you have a difficult past like, like I did. Um, so I think that, that uh, I think it's a really good protective factor for mental health to have that self-confidence and to know mm. who you are, that it is something that tends to come with maturity more than, more than not. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a double edged sword in that sense, because um, if you don't have the so if you haven't had the success, if you haven't seen this, if you haven't had the proof that you can do it, it's hard to know that the future can be different in that sense. Yeah, yeah it's taking a risk. So when I applied for my public service job, I was 30, I think or 31. And my first book, Finding a Different Kind of Normal, had just come out. Um, like three months before I applied for those jobs. And that was the final thing for me. I'd done all these incremental steps to getting a full-time professional jo job. And the book was the final one. That was the one that gave me confidence. Um, but if I didn't have that book, I wouldn't have had that confidence. And um, the book, in, you know, there are things in your life that are catalysts for change. And for me, that book was a very, very big catalyst for change. And mm -hmm. if I didn't have that, I think I really would have struggled to get the job and to, to think I was capable of, of doing anything really. Yeah, it's interesting because we um, often try and help people to achieve things. And it sounds like a big thing from your story is what you really needed was the confidence. And then once you had the confidence, you could go out and actually uh, do the things that you wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And now I don't even think twice about it. You know, this is just me. I'm I'm totally overloaded at the moment. I'm moving house in three weeks. I've got trips interstate. I've got a bunch of talks online. Uh, I've got my paid work, which is you know, um, you know, in, involving, you know, engaging, and I have to have to really be present for that. Um, all of these things, I've got to go into a different mental health service because I'm moving to a different suburb. All of these things are really stressful. But I'm at a point now where I think, well, oh, just take it as you go, you know, but take it one day at a time and see how you are. And I know that. And I know that from experience. And sometimes those experiences we have that are really challenging can actually become really useful parts of building our resilience and our independence and all of those things. Um, so I do tend to think that having some challenges can be viewed in a positive way as well. Yeah, and, and for someone, uh, there, there might be people listening who can relate to a lot of those things um, at, at this stage. And it, it can be really helpful to hear that others have gone through it and that, and that you can, you know, you can get through it. Yeah. I'm a big fan of strategies. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of do what works. I always say do what works unless it's dangerous or illegal, then don't do it. But <laughs> if you find this strategy is effective for you around mental health particularly, embrace it, make it part of your experience, make it part of your day because it can make a huge difference. I have a list of strategies that I use and some of them work in some situations and others work in other situations. But I've got a few that are gold standard strategies that I will go right to every time I need to and find that really helpful. The big one for me is distraction. And distraction is fantastic because you focus on something other than whatever your brain's worrying about. And the focusing on the other thing shifts the focus of your mood and your experience of mental health issues. It shifts it into a more meaningful way of, of experiencing life and something that's actually useful. The other thing is the idea of failing successfully, you know, finding um, success in failure and setbacks and saying, what, not saying, oh, this is great that everything went wrong, but saying, well, everything went wrong, but what have I learned from that? How is that mm. going to get me to do things differently in the future? And I'm a big, when I, I've got two books on resilience that I wrote with the wonderful Dr. Emma Goodall, who's a good friend, 
co-author and um, you know, colleague of mine in this space. Um, we wrote these books about resilience for um, kids and for teens. And we sent the proposal to the publisher and I'd put in one of the chapters was failing successfully. And the publisher got back to us and said, oh, I love that idea of failing successfully. But it is, it's not saying it's okay that everything went wrong. It's about acknowledging that everything went wrong and learning from that as best you can. So I think that that kind of notion of making use of difficult situations, if you can take something helpful from something difficult, well, that makes it less of a problem. Hmm. Um, and what, what are some of your favourite go-to distractions? So television is my thing. I have one in the bedroom, I have one in the lounge room. The one in the lounge room is as big as this wide brown land we call Australia. Uh, well, not quite, but getting on for it. And I have a Papa Sun chair in the, um, in the, the lounge room with a footstool and I lie back on that and just watch all of it and it's, it's a very good distraction. Um, work. Work is a it works a bit of a tool okay. can actually be the reason that you're feeling stressed, but it can also be a really wonderful distraction from the stress. So focusing on like drafting a presentation or writing a book or something like that can be a really lovely distraction. Um, and yeah, and my day job is also a good distraction because you, there's the whole work ethic thing as well. I'm not going to go to work and slack off because they're paying me for it. So. Um, if I'm at work, then I'm going to be focusing on my job, which will take my mind off whatever mental health nasties are going on. Sometimes distraction doesn't work. If the mental health nasties are really bad, um, you can distract as much as you like and it makes no difference whatsoever. Mm. But that's the thing about strategies is knowing which ones to use in which situation. So if that's going on, if I'm in such a bad place that I can't distract, I'll call the mental health crisis team or I'll call my clinical manager if it's in mm. um, working hours um, and, you know, seek support from them or I'll go and stay with a friend or something like that. Um, I used to have a cat and he was a very good therapist, um, a good Miss Black Kitty therapist. Um, I don't have a cat at the moment, but when I move, I'm moving in three weeks, when I move, uh, my plan is to get myself my own little kitty cat. Mm. And lots of autistic people find comfort and support in their pets. Mm. And I think distraction itself is a highly underrated strategy because it it it's it seems like it, within the name distraction, it sounds like you're just putting it off temporarily and it's going to come back later. But actually, it can be really powerful to get you through that moment until you can do the next thing. Absolutely. And the thing about mental health difficulties is they're cyclical. So they'll come and they'll go. And if you can put it off and then it goes, that's great. You know, that's a really mm. good thing. The other one I like that somebody said, oh, I love that that uh, opposite action skill of Yen Perkis's. Well, I, I will correct him on that because I did not come up with the opposite action skill. That was Marsha Linehan who wrote the, um, the skills manual for dialectical behaviour therapy. So that was, that was her idea, but I've used it myself and I recommend it as the idea of opposite action. And that is another one that does works the same way as distraction, which is tricking your brain into thinking differently. And opposite action works really nicely for depression. So if you're depressed, you'll wake up and you'll think, ugh, I'm so depressed, I'm not getting out of bed, I feel dreadful. If you don't get out of bed, chances are you'll continue feeling dreadful. If you do get out of bed, if you challenge those depressive thoughts that are telling you to do mm. something, you challenge that and do the opposite of what it says, almost certainly going to make a difference. It might not get rid of the depression. Um, it probably won't get rid of the depression, but in that moment, it actually provides a strategy for similar to distraction for tricking your brain into feeling different. And I find mm. that really helpful, particularly it actually works for elevated mood mania as well. But the problem with elevated mood is, okay. well, I, I can only speak for myself, but if I'm elevated, I want to stay elevated. Like if I'm depressed, I don't want to yeah. keep depressed. 
if I'm elevated, I'm really happy to stay elevated. And that, that is a bit of a problem in and of itself. I remember last time I was in hospital, it was about this time last year, and uh, I had a few episodes of mania while I was there. And one of the when the Olympics were on, and I was running up and down the corridor saying, hey, it's the Acacia Ward Olympics. <laughs> and I got told off by the nurses because it was uh, not the work health and safety to be running yep. up and down the corridors. But yeah, so when you feel like that, you have to challenge it. And that, that's the challenge of, of, of mania, I guess. But yeah, opposite action, good skill. And not mine. I didn't make it up. I'm not <laughs> but happy to borrow it and happy to use it when it works. Absolutely. I'm always happy to share useful things with other people. And another uh, curious personal question, what's your relationship to colour? Colour? Well, Do I you like a lot of colour. You might say I'm a bit purple today. Oh, and I've got these butterfly earrings. How cute are those? I bought those the other day. Um, and yeah, the, hair is, the hair is definitely coloured. Colour makes me happy. Um, it is when I'm in hospital, and I've been in hospital dozens of times over my life. And one of the things everyone notices about me in hospital is that I dress really beautifully, and I always I put on jewellery, I wear nice things, and it's important to me. And style is important to me. Colour is important to me. Art is important to me. And if I'm in a dark spot something beautiful or something colorful will make me feel happier and i've always been that way i've been an artist like i've considered myself an artist since i was 17. um and so i mean you see in my house there's lots of art um always this one's a rental the one i've just bought is mine so i'm going to go crazy with the art it's just going to be everywhere um but yeah no color is extremely important to me as a style I often on my social media and people like this stuff. I, when I first started doing it, I thought, oh, people are just going to think how self-indulgent is the end. But I do. I post my outfits on my social media and people love it. And then I went to a conference last week in Melbourne. I was a speaker at the Australian Autism Conference. And there was this person there and they had the same pair of floral Doc Martin shoes that I've got. And I saw their shoes and I went up to them and I said, oh my gosh, you've got the same shoes as me. And they said, yes, I know, that's why I wore them today. <laughs> it was wonderful. So yeah, people do engage with my, uh, my idiosyncratic sense of style. Well, there's, there's so much more to it than just the clothes. I mean, it's, it's the expression, it's how it makes you feel, it's how it makes others feel just by witnessing your posts on social media. I wore a jacket yesterday that was rain not rainbow rainbow, but rainbow colours. And I went down the street, it's really bright, like it's probably one of the brightest things I've got. And I went down the street and I got two compliments from strangers about it. And that happens all the time. I walked down the street. The other day I was walking down the street and I've got this top that I bought and it's almost like a hologram sort of thing, like green, shiny, really, really colourful. And this woman said, excuse me, I love that. I love that shirt. And then she said, are you LGBTQ? And I said, yes, actually I am. And she invited me to her lesbian movie night, but then she didn't give me any details, so I couldn't go. But no, I thought that was the funniest thing ever. And that kind of thing happens to me all the time, which makes me happy. I'm a very happy person, unless I'm unwell, but I'm a very engaged person. You know, I like to talk to people. I like to, to tell stories. I like to hear stories. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very much an extrovert. Um, so I, I do like that. I think if I was an introvert, I'd probably be more worried about people giving me compliments and I wouldn't want them to talk to me. Whereas I'm quite happy for people to say, oh, I love your talk, you know, because it makes me happy. And then you talk to them. And life's too short not to talk to people about your shiny shirt. Yeah, I'm definitely more introverted than that. If I if I wore something that everyone would comment on, I would probably swap out to something else. <laughs> Um, so we are live at the moment, which means we've got a, a chat going. So if anyone has um, questions in the chat that, they, that they'd like for, for Yen, um, feel free to put that in. 
Um, there's there's a few things um, questions about the whole, the psychosis element um, and distinguishing that from from autism. And so one said, can autism cause psychosis or delusions when stressed? And another person says, is psychosis common amongst people on the spectrum? I had a bad episode in my teens. Yeah. I think on both those counts, yes and yes. Um, psychosis is quite common for autistic people. There are misdiagnoses, so you can get misdiagnosed as having a psychotic illness uh, because you're autistic and it's misunderstood. Or you can get correctly diagnosed as having psychosis and being autistic. Or you can get correctly diagnosed as having psychosis, but missed out in the diagnosis for your autism side so is quite a nuanced sort of thing there mm. um, and yeah um, for me um, if i'm stressed i will get more psychotic symptoms um, it doesn't if i get really stressed what usually happens is it builds and builds and builds and then i suddenly have this physical sense of falling and I know at that point, I'm going to be really unwell for at least the next six months. Wow, and okay. that you can have psychotic symptoms and not be experiencing a psychotic episode. So for me, I get what my psychiatrist terms visual delusions. So everything looks meaningful. Everything looks like it's got more to say than it really does. So I'll look at the, um, I'll look at a plant and it'll look like it's got light it'll look alive and everything's got meaning and then I can get really frightened and think that things are going to do bad stuff to me. I can get that without actually being psychotic. I can get paranoid without actually being psychotic. If I'm psychotic, everything's going on at the same time and there's not much I can do about it and I feel very vulnerable and very scared and it's like a waking nightmare and I'm never quite sure, like I'll walk around saying, I don't know who I am, I don't know who I am. Yeah. I'm not myself. Um, I had, when I was unwell last year, apparently I couldn't remember this. I often don't remember when I've been psychotic, um, what I've actually done or said. And my friend told me, my close friend told me, I called her up on the phone and I said, I am Yen. And then I hung up and she said, and you didn't even sound all that convinced that you were Yen. <laughs> Which I think is wonderful. but. Um, seriously though, no, it's, it's not pleasant um, and it is more common for this people, I think, than, I haven't seen data on this, but anecdotally, it is quite common for autistic people to experience psychosis or psychotic symptoms and things like that. And there is definitely a relationship around that with, um, with anxiety. And there certainly is with me. I remember when I was um, at university, I had this one class and it went for five hours. Uh, I studied fine art at university, and this was a drawing class, and it, it was intense. It was, you had to engage with what you were doing and be totally aware of what was going on and everything, and it was just very stressful. And it went for five hours, and it finished mm. at 30 in the evening. So when I was coming home, it would be dark, and I'd be scared, and I would always get psychotic symptoms coming home. But I wasn't actually unwell, I was just stressed. Um, mm. so yeah, that was quite a long answer to a couple of short questions. That's okay. Um, so I have a question after that. How do you, how have you built your sense of self around that, around the experience that you've just described? It's interesting. I'm the, I'm the absolute master of denial. Like I could, I could deny health stuff for, for Australia. I really could. Um, so I didn't accept my autism for seven years and I didn't accept my schizophrenia for 26 years. Um, so wow. I didn't want either of those things to be part of my identity. Autism, I think I just didn't understand what it meant. I thought it meant that the bullies at school were right with all the things they said about me and that I was a nerd and you know, no one would ever be my friend, so I don't want that autism thing. And so that was that, was that one. And, and also I didn't like myself and I didn't want to see myself as autistic because that didn't seem a very nice identity for me. I mean, now I'm out loud and proud. I tell everyone I'm autistic, you know. I don't even have to tell people I'm autistic. They already know. Um, but with schizophrenia, 
I worried. I'd known a lot of people with schizophrenia and I didn't want to be like them. I remember one of the things was I had these friends as a couple and they both had schizophrenia and they were really dreadful friends and they'd ditch anyone, like, and they ditched me and I thought, well, I'm not like that, I don't ditch people and that must be what people with schizophrenia do. I didn't understand what the diagnosis really meant. Um, I also saw a number of people with schizophrenia and they were zombies and they, you know, the, the medication made them really slow and everything. I've been taking antipsychotic medication since 1995, but I never, never associated that with myself. Um, and I never wanted to have schizophrenia, you know, it seemed to be a really nasty thing to have. Mm. Um, so when I did accept it, it was not sudden, it was not like, yeah, that's me. Uh, I still doubt it sometimes, not that anyone else doubts it, I don't think anyone who knows me doubts it. Um, and I do know that if I don't take the medication, I get unwell. So that suggests to me logically that I have the illness or I wouldn't need to take the medication. But um, the medication I take now is clozapine, which is a pretty full on medication and you have to have it all monitored and everything. So, yeah. But yes, my yeah. community now has incorporated my autistic identity and my uh, identity as a person with schizophrenia. Yeah, well, I guess that's the thing about reality. It can be quite persistent, even if you try and ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess the, the challenge is to accept things that are going on in a helpful way, even if they're not good things. Yeah. Like it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you enjoy having schizophrenia, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, but accepting it is, is, a diff is asking a different question. Yeah. yeah, acceptance is not about saying it's okay. It's about saying, well, this is how it is. What can I do to work with this to make it better? That's, that's your radical acceptance. That is the hardest mental health skill to my mind because none of us want to do it. We all want to fight against it and say, no, no, but that's not right. Well, it might not be right, but it is how it is. And mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so um, for something like autism, where there are lots of positives as well as challenges, I guess it's a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, autism is great for positives, although I get a bit annoyed, you know, when you talk about autism and employment and the, 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 what you're expected to do these days is make a big long list of all the positive attributes of autistic employees. Now that's great, I'm all for that, but why are we not doing that for white cisgender, uh, straight, heterosexual, able-bodied men? Why are we not making a list of their positive um, employment attributes? Because autistic people, it should be a given that we you know, we're a positive in the workplace. Um, I think, yeah, but as you say, autism does have a fair number of positive attributes, you know, to tick off down the list. Um, and, and then there's the social model of disability, um, which, you know, makes autism a difference, more than a disability so much. Whereas I think with schizophrenia, there are definite deficits in there. And that, to my mind, and you notice I say I am autistic and that I have schizophrenia. And the reason I do that is that autism is a key part of what makes me who I am. It's an integral part of my identity and my sense of self mm. and my character. Schizophrenia is not. Schizophrenia is an illness. Autism is a difference. And I think that's, for me, that's a really important distinction. If you could cure schizophrenia, if you could give me a little squirty spray that says schizophrenia be gone and I just give myself a couple of squirts, I'd be signing up for that straight away. But if someone said I can cure autism, I'd say, no, thank you. I actually like being me. So I think that's a really important consideration as well around autism and mental health. And also I will say that that's just my experience. Other people have different experiences. There's no right or wrong with identity. How a person chooses to identify is correct. Um, and you can't question someone's identity and you can't tell them not to identify how they choose to. 
and that's really important and that each person's experience of this will be different. And it's a it's a pretty tough question to answer anyway um, because you're talking about something that is not a reality. So if I could ha if I could change a decision that I made 10 years ago, would I do it? If I could not be autistic, would I do it? If I could suddenly win the lottery tomorrow, would I do it? Like it's 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 a nice sort of hypothetical question, but we can't really know what that actually means in in a in a real life. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you've alluded a little bit to your story um, over the last decade or two. Um, how has your sense of self sort of changed over, over that time? I, I see myself differently now. Like I never used to have, as I mentioned, I never had a lot of confidence. And that's definitely going... And my identity as an autistic person has really grown quite significantly. So when I wrote, wrote my first book, um, I was sort of thrust into the autism advocacy world. And um, people expected me to have opinions about things I didn't have opinions about. And it was quite challenging. And it, I had to sort of learn to fake it a little bit with the confidence. And also with the autism knowledge. My autism knowledge is nothing. All I knew about was me. But I rapidly mm. grew in my understanding and confidence around autism and what I was having to say. And I think as the last sort of 10 years has been a, a real blossoming of my life and my identity. And so in 2012, I met an autistic young man who, when I told him I was autistic, had written a book and worked in the public service, he said, no, nah, you're lying, that's not possible. Um, it's not very nice to have someone say that your experience is a lie, but the worst thing about that was that he said that because in his world, yeah, it was not possible. And so at yeah. that moment, I realised I wanted to make a world where autistic people could do meaningful things for them, be that working or studying or painting or whatever, but doing things, not being limited by other people's deficits of autism. So I became passionate. I got on a mission. I did. I was on a mission. I was still on a mission. And then I, shortly after that encounter, I wrote my second book and then my third, my fourth and my fifth and the sixth. And I now have a living list of things. And my confidence, not just as an autism advocate, but as a person, has really grown through my advocacy career. Um, and in the background to that has been my paid work, my day job, which has been lovely and has been really engaging and rewarding and a good thing to do. And it's also given me a lovely income so that I can buy my nice property, which I just bought. Um, but yeah, so things sort of, uh, my life at the moment is really caught up with the book and, and the advocacy work and what, what that means. And mm. I love it and I'm now, I mean, it's a weird thing to say about yourself, but I'm a community leader. I'm one of the most visible autistic advocates in the world. It's all very weird, and it's all because I met someone who thought I was lying about writing a book and working in the public service. So I guess I've got my advocacy career to thank to that young man. But, um, yeah. Well, that's um, sharing stories and experiences is a very validating experience both in the sharing and in the hearing of other people's experiences that are, that are similar similar to our own so i think that's part of why this is such it's such a powerful thing to do yeah. Yeah, absolutely i think stories and narrative are really powerful i think um yeah sharing our experience is such an important thing to do and I, I remember when I first started out as an advocate, there was somebody who was a bit hardline and they said, oh, Yem Perkis, all they do is tell stories. You know, that's not activism. And I'm thinking, activism is largely about sharing stories to my understanding. It's, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. 
um, I, I, one of my favorite phrases is one mission is better than a thousand options. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah I'm always um, <laughs> Especially for anyone who struggles with executive dysfunction, <laughs> too many options can be quite paralyzing. Whereas one mission can actually put everything in perspective so that you can focus that. Yeah, yeah. My dad said to me tonight, you need to make a list. And I thought, yep, you're absolutely right. I need to make a list. So, A list of? All the things I need to do in the next three weeks. Ah, oh, right. Yes. Well, it sounds like you're in, in, in an incredibly busy time. Or is this just what Yen's life is like oh, <laughs> all yeah. the time? It's pretty much what my life's like most of the time. Slightly more, slightly more. I've got, so as I said, I've got Melbourne tomorrow. I'm speaking for, oh, I can't even remember the name of the organisation, but they're psychologists and, and people like that. So I'm talking about mental health. I don't get to talk about mental health as much as I used to. I often find myself talking about gender diversity these days. Mm. I was in Melbourne last week talking about gender diversity. But, yeah, oh, I, 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 look, how organised is I? I even got a copy of this one. <laughs> yep, good. And then the other one here, this is the latest one. There we go. Awesome autistic guide. Yep. Yeah, there we go. That's number three and number 11, respectively. Yeah, because um, you started off just sharing from your own personal experience, I guess, and then um, it, that your experience obviously grows over the years as you meet people and discover yourself and, and things like that. And so that makes sense that, that recently the um, gender identity stuff would be coming to the fore a little bit yeah definitely it's quite interesting the gender space because it is a space where there is a lot more bigotry than anywhere else i'm working and so you okay. can get some really cranky people which is not really okay thankfully i have the right response which is to get angry the worst response is to turn it inwards and think oh yes i am a dreadful person and that's mm. that's that if, they, if someone hates you, the, the correct response is to reject their opinion because, you know, hating me because of my gender is kind of ridiculous, really. But, um, yeah, no, I, I like... So I work in the... Most of my talks around gender, mental health, resilience, employment, advocacy, and then my life story as well. So. Mm. So how has that changed for you recently um, your own, with your own gender identity? Oh, it's been really interesting. So I came out about just over four years ago um, in 2018. And I've been thinking about my gender for a while, but there hadn't really been much language around gender diversity that was appropriate to how I felt. So I sort of felt like my gender was not the typical, but I wasn't sure what it actually was. And so over sort of about a 12 month period, I was talking with autistic and transgender friends. And, and I remember I had a conference in Perth and uh, they had drinks afterwards and I got talking to someone and they said, and I said to them, oh, I think I'm non-binary and asexual. And they said, yeah, me too. Now that's lovely because the first time I'd actually put it into the world that I was transgender um, or non-binary, um, and the person I said it to not only was receptive and, and respectful, but felt. So that worked well. And yeah. shortly after that, and this is hilarious, I was telling my friend about this today, and, and she thought it was really funny too. So I, um, I came out, she's non-binary, in May 2018 on Facebook. That was where I came out first, not to a family, not to a friend, to the thousands of people on my Facebook page. Um, and yes, of course. some of them were supportive and some of them were not. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was pretty liberating. I remember the first sort of three months after I came out, I felt like dancing down the street. I just felt fantastic. I went to the hairdresser and I said, I just came out as non-binary, reflecting <laughs> my hairstyle. <laughs> I don't know that hair actually can be non-binary because it's not sentient and it doesn't have a sense of identity, but 
you did a good job. Um, but uh, they they took you up on the challenge. Yes. <laughs> but no, it's so it's been lovely mostly. I, I love my identity. It makes me feel really proud. I got to go and march in Mardi Gras 2019 with um, Aspect in their float. Well, it wasn't a float; it was just a contingent. And that was amazing, actually, because they had like hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets. And I was going and doing a high five along the whole... So I, I did the, the whole course twice because I kept running back and then running back to the, the group. But it was just amazing, actually. It was quite lovely. And, um, yeah, no, and it's great. I have a friend in Melbourne and just after I came out, her child came out. And so I was staying with this, this friend. And I came down the stairs for breakfast and my friend said to her child, hey, um, Yan uses they them pronouns too. And this kid's face just lit up. They were so happy. And I thought, gee, if me being out is, you know, has that impact, that's a lovely thing. Like, I don't even have to do anything except be myself. And it makes young people who are questioning their gender feel really good about themselves. And that's a nice thing. Some people hate it. Some people hate mm -hmm. and give you a hard time and uh, uh, I don't understand what the issue is. My gender's got nothing to do with anyone else other than me. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it is one area where the bigots are pretty passionate. And I guess because it's so far from some people's experiences, it can be a bit hard to understand. So finding other people like that first person you first named it for um is so helpful because if someone else can actually understand whoops yeah. dropped my thingy someone else can actually understand what you're experiencing or or at least similar yeah definitely i had one person on social media who started out being really hostile and quite critical and so i blocked them and then six months down the track they got a hold of me, I can't remember how, but they got a hold of me and apologised. And it was a genuine apology. And I said, thank you. And I knew that it was a genuine apology because for the next six months, they shared everything I posted. <laughs> but it was really interesting. And I'm, somebody mm. said, oh, how could you forgive them? And I'm like, well, how could I not forgive them? This is yeah. my personal history. I've done loads of dreadful things, worse than being a bigot, but much worse than that. Um, no one blames me for that now. So if I started blaming people who've, you know, have changed their ways, I'd be something of a hypocrite, really. So I thought that was, you know, I had no issue with, with accepting that apology. Um, and yeah. It's a hard thing to do to make it, you know, to make an apology to someone. And if someone is legitimately recognising that they had a regrettable reaction, then it's fantastic that we can sort of celebrate that great you have come to a realization about how you, you know about how you reacted and and how that affected people and and all of that kind of stuff so yeah. all my parents i've got to share my parents they're fantastic so neurodivergent family mum's diagnosed that kind of thing um quite christian and like quite conservatively christian and so most people's quite conservatively Christian parents, when confronted with a transgender and non-binary child, would go, oh no, what do we do? My parents, when I went and stayed with them, and they said, oh, we got you some rainbow bread. And I said, yeah, most people's conservative Christian parents, when they came out, would go, oh no, what do I do? My parents, yep, they're with the rainbow bread. <laughs> And I, I, I have to share what I think is a hilarious comment uh, just from before. So thank you, Alicia, for this. Um, it, it appeals to my, to my brain. Um, isn't it ironic? I'm, I'm paraphrasing a, a little bit. Isn't it ironic that if you're either binary, so if you're either non-binary or not non-binary, then you're into binary categories. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I have just to, in case um, someone needed to stretch their brain a little bit. <laughs> I, like that. I had somebody tell me that I shouldn't wear a skirt because I'm non-binary. And I had to, I didn't say this publicly, but I certainly said it privately. I said, oh, well, if I can't wear a skirt, I guess I can't wear pants. Am I allowed to wear a 
Probably. I think that would be ex no. <laughs> that would be equally unacceptable. <laughs> And yeah, of course, the answer to that is that clothes do not have a gender. Clothes have no sense of identity or self. Uh, you can wear whatever the heck you like. Hmm. And I, I would have thought that the concept of non-binary would have been slightly easier for people to wrap their head around because it doesn't fit a category properly. It's not that you're breaking previous categories it's just that you're not quite fitting the existing two options yeah. Yeah. um but it sounds like most people have been fairly supportive with that most people have been good. i did have a thing i did a video diary on um youtube and it was all about coming out the first couple of ones i did were really well received it got some good views got some comments and then the third one I did, I think rent a troll uh, descended upon me. Uh, there were many, many of them, like 30 or 40 of them all saying horrible things. And I'm like, nah, I think at this point I'm going to turn off the comments. Uh, so that was a bit unpleasant. That was a bit yeah. But most people have been lovely. It's difficult, though, because my pronouns are they, them. So I had to explain that to people. And, you know, so basically everyone I meet, I have to come out to. Funny yeah. enough, the great book by Sabrina Symington called Coming Out Again, and it's a graphic novel and it sort of follows these young people um, and they belong like the um, polyamorous and uh, transgender and non-binary, um, many are neurodivergent and people of colour. It's a lovely, lovely book. I did an endorsement for it, actually, so I got a free copy. Yay! Um, but it's all about that idea of, yeah, you come out several times. Um, and I do. I come, every time I meet someone and they need to be able to describe me, I need to tell them my pronouns. And so the opportunity for people to be really lovely and supportive is definitely there but also the opportunity for people to be quite bigoted. So mm -hmm. it is, sometimes I feel it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, you know, you're not always ready to be in a situation where someone could go from being friendly to hostile, you know, yeah. in like two seconds. But yeah, mostly it's okay. It's pretty good and I get to be myself, which is the main thing. It's funny because people are frequently misgendering me and it kept happening and I kept getting really annoyed. And I thought, oh, I don't know, just change my pronouns back. And I thought that for about two seconds. And then I thought, no, nah, I can't do that. It's not me. And that was a lovely yeah. realisation. The other lovely realisation was the I'm not trans enough questions. So it's very common for transgender people, uh, not all of us, but lots of us, to think, oh, I'm not trans enough. And I was thinking that. And then I came on this lovely epiphany, which was if I identify as trans, I am trans. And that's absolutely true. If you identify as being transgender or anything else, you mm. are. Yeah, and I guess it makes sense sometimes to allow yourself the, the decision, do I correct someone on this occasion or do I not? Or because, you know, uh, I, know, I know it's not quite the same, but just with advocacy stuff in general, I know sometimes if I'm if I'm not in the mood or if I'm too tired or out of work mode, mm. I don't need to educate people all the time. You can just yeah. let things slide sometimes. Yeah. I find that with autism, like when, when I go and give a talk, if I'm in a cab or something and the cabbie asks me, where, where I'm going, what am I doing? I say, oh, I'm off to a conference. And then I know they're going to say, oh, what's the conference? And I think, oh, now I'm going to have to go into, it's about autism. And they're like, oh, what's your interest in that? Are you a parent? Like, no, I'm autistic. Oh, what does that mean? It's like, I just want to get to the conference venue, please. <coughs> what it means is I don't like talking to people in taxis, no, yeah. which is probably not true in your case if you're more extroverted oh, no, than me. I don't like talking to strangers unless it's something like a brief encounter. I can do that mm. with a taxi ride. I don't want them talking to me. Mm. Especially if it's a long trip, then you have to talk to them. It's ugh, exhausting. So. Um. So it strikes me that 
the more you have to say, especially the more public you are with um, a, a message, any message, the more negative responses you're going to yes. accumulate. How do, how do you personally deal with that inevitability of being in the public eye? I have a lot of people that hate me. There's, and I say hate meaning hate, a lot of people really don't like me. And um, it used to upset me. Now, as long as they don't actually do anything, like if they try and hack into my accounts or something like that, I'll, I'll be pissed off. But if they just want to hate me, that's fine. But I don't like everybody. There's people in the autistic advocacy community that I have issues with. I don't air those issues publicly because it's not appropriate. But if people, if I'm allowed to not like other people, they're fully allowed to not like me. Um, and I don't really take it personally because I think when it's someone who's a stranger, they don't know who I am. They just know my public profile. That's not me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very easy. There's that whole thing we have in Australia it's called poppy syndrome. You know, if someone's successful in their work or whatever, then, um, you know, people don't like them and give them a hard time. Well, I don't think that's very helpful. I don't do that. I'm mm. quite happy for other people to have success. I think it's great. I'm quite happy for people to give talks because it means I don't have to do them all. Um, you know, I, I think it's nicer to support and respect one another. And I think in my world, there's people that actually know me and don't like me. And then there's people that know my work and don't like me. And they're quite different things. But yeah, as long as they don't do anything horrible, yeah, I have a, I have a bit of a framework around that. What you described is like the opposite of the masking kind of shame. Because if you're, if you're masking and everyone likes you, yeah. you can think, oh, but if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Whereas you're describing the opposite. You're, you've got a public image. Yeah. And you're saying, yes, but if you really knew me, you would like me. <laughs> yeah. I'm nice. I'm not, I mean, I'm obviously not perfect. I've got plenty of faults and foibles and, you know, odd things going on. But generally, I think I'm quite a kind and respectful person and I want the best for people. Um, and, you know, I give a lot of my time to, to work like this, um, advocacy work. And a lot of what I do, I don't get paid for. These days I get paid for most of it. Uh, I had somebody want me to do something and they offered to give me a gift voucher, which I thought was not really appropriate. Would they do that to Tony Atwood, do you reckon? Probably not. Um, and Probably I find not. that kind of thing borders on ableism or doesn't border on ableism, it is ableism. Um, yeah, um, so yes, I do prefer if someone's going to ask me to do something that they remunerate me correctly. Um, yeah, I do love what I do. And, and I, I, I started doing this for all the right reasons, which was that I saw somebody who had been influenced by people's deficit thinking about autism very negatively, and that I wanted a world where autistic people mm -hmm. didn't have to deal with that. And that is what started me on my journey. And it has been a journey, it's a continuing journey. Um, I'm not motivated by profile. I'm not motivated by um, fame or anything like that. I mean, when it comes down to it, you're not that famous. It, even somebody like Temple Grandin, they're only really famous in the autism world, in the cow world. Um, you know, the, the rest of the world. So, yeah, fame's a bit of a weird concept in this space. And it's not something I want. In fact, the more well known I get, the less well known I want to be, because it does come with yeah. a lot of hatred. Um, and, you know, it's not good. Most people go on their Facebook, they just see nice things that people have said. Sometimes I go on my Facebook and someone's given me a serve that I don't even know who they are. And that kind of thing, you know, I'd be quite happy to be less well known if that was the case. But I do want my work to get into the world, because I know my work yeah. is good. I'm fairly certain my work is good. I think it's helpful. I think it's really funny though, because for me, everything I do is stating the obvious. Um, and people say, oh, it's amazing your insights on this. And I'm thinking, 
have any insights on that. It's just obvious. So it's like, I oh, know it's obvious to you because you know it. So, mm. uh, yeah. Um, so we should wrap up soon. So if anyone has any last minute questions in the chat, let us, let us know. Um, and I was, I was just thinking that there, fortunately, there are more and more self advocates around in the public domain at the moment, sharing their stories and doing, continuing this work. Um, but when you, when you started, when you're, you know, back in the era where you were talking about meeting that that person who thought it was impossible, there were so few advocates that we, you've been described as a trailblazer for pretty good reasons. <laughs> um, we needed someone to look up. We all need someone to look up to, to have that realization that actually I can do this, even though there's nothing in my life that would give me the evidence to say that I should be able to do it. I'm going to look at someone else who's in a similar situation, say, well, if they did it, maybe I can too. Yeah. Absolutely. I, my story is, you know, I use this word unlikely. It's a very unlikely life story. I shouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing according to convention, according to most other people's situation. I'm an ex-prisoner. Not just one time, I was in prison five times, um, ex-drug user, and not just, you know, a little, a lot. I lived in public housing and in crisis accommodation for many years. As I say, I've been in ten, 10 years in institutions over my life of one kind or another. I'm a career public servant. I'm an 11 times published author. I've spoken at TEDx. I've given hundreds of presentations over the years. I have a huge following on social media. Um, all of these things I should not be. I really shouldn't. And I'm not destroyed by my past. And I have a past that mm. should destroy me. And I'm not. I'm not holding on to all the trauma and misery from the past. Um, I have mental health issues. People who have them are not able to do the things I do. I'm very fortunate mm. I've had a good life and I see my life as being a good life, even though a lot of it has been very difficult. Um, and I guess that gratitude is what makes it possible for me to do the things I do. But I'm very unlikely. I, I often wonder if people believe me when I <laughs> say some of the things in my past, but I assure you, it is all true. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, gratitude is my feeling. That is absolutely. Uh, so Rob is asking, any tips for entering a career in advocacy for autistic and queer people in Australia? Oh, get in touch with some good organisations. Um, people like Spectrum Intersections in Melbourne, uh, the ICANN network is quite good. Um, Reframe and Autism are very good. And um, just see if there's things you can do with them and put your stuff in the world. I don't know if you like writing, but if you like writing, a blog is a lovely thing and you can do a nice blog and then you can post that on social media. Um, build your social media profile if you enjoy social media, that is where it's all happening these days. I don't use all the platforms, I just use Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. But there's a bunch of other ones. There's the one, I use all the old person social media sites but there's young person social media sites too, just to be a stereotype. Um, what else? Just get yourself out there. Just um, get take up opportunities. Um, presentations are really good. They don't have to just do presentations. You can do focus groups and, yeah. And, yeah, get mm. a channel and do some YouTube things. There's loads and, of and what out there. And what I would echo with that is that it's all about the community and there are already people out there doing stuff. And if you want to help out, you can get on board and start helping with whatever's already going on. And then you'll get to know the community really well. You'll get to know what the needs are really well. You'll figure out what it is that is your personal, what you're personally bringing. Um, to to the community to the world and yeah it's it we definitely 
get a lot more done when we can work together like that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, I think we might wrap up there if that's okay, Yen. So thanks so much for coming along. Thanks so much everyone in the chat for joining us live uh, and making it interactive for everyone. Um, the Autism from the Inside Online Summit starts on Monday. Um, if you haven't seen all of our live events yet, we have a live screening for every uh, speaker. There is um, a 24 seven virtual social space, which is very exciting um, just for that for that whole week, as well as some hosted social events. So um, if you haven't already registered for that, then um, that's a you can you can do that for free. Um, otherwise, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to finish with Yen? Oh, just thank you for having me on the chat and make sure everyone goes and checks out the summit because it'll be really good. Um, I think myself and Emma and Goodall are in there talking about mental health, which is lovely. Um, and yeah, it's really nice talking to you all. And uh, isn't it funny these days, we're all online and talking on Zoom and whatever else. It's, um, it's a funny thing. Anyway, thank you. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll better go take my meds and go to bed and go to Melbourne tomorrow morning. Mm. Okay, thanks everyone.